a Boston conservative in the cradle of liberty. You'll want to listen when Chuck Moore speaks on the Information Radio Network. Thank you very much. Hour number two of Chuck Moore Speaks, Monday through Friday, 10 till noon at the USA Network. You're welcome to join the program, 844-439-1391, 844-439-1391. My guest this segment is Barbara Anderson. Barbara is an independent writing and editing professional. She's a SNAP leader. She's an advocate for child protection, formerly with the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Uh, Barbara is now um, a spokesperson for Survivors Network, of those abused by priests and uh, a part of protect children from sexual abuse. Barbara, thanks for joining me this afternoon. Good morning, Chuck. I'm pleased to be here. Barbara, you. Uh, I want you to, before we get into a very important story here, I'd like you to talk a little bit about how you came to be involved in your advocacy and in your actions with regard to exposing the Watchtower. Well, I became one of Jehovah's Witnesses when I was only uh, 14 years old. I was a Catholic girl, and I wanted questions answered about doctrines, and the priest didn't pay any attention to me. And I became disenchanted when two of my girlfriends were molested by a uh, priest. And so I really didn't know where to go with myself uh, religiously, and I met Jehovah's Witnesses. They uh, took an interest in me, answered my questions from the Bible, which really impressed me. I thought I found what many people think is the truth about God's purpose. Yeah. So I married a, a one of Jehovah's Witnesses as a, when I was 19. We were very, very happy in our religion, and most of our religion was the time was spent going in the door-to-door ministry, as everyone's familiar with Jehovah's Witnesses and what they do. In the 80s, my husband was invited to the world headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, of Jehovah's Witnesses, and that headquarters is called the Watchtower. And so it's the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. When I was there, I we were volunteers. We didn't get paid. We got room and board, and I really liked it. The Witnesses are very nice people, and we had a great life there. I was eventually assigned to the writing department. I had experience in uh, research from previous jobs before I went to the headquarters. My husband was involved with their building. They were uh, expanding their ownership of buildings in the Brooklyn Heights area. So we had a son, and he also was there. He went into the headquarters when he was 19 years old. So we went a year later. And when I was uh, in the writing uh, department of the headquarters, I was a researcher. I researched their history book that came out. And it was then, in 1991, that I became aware that the witnesses had a child sexual abuse problem. And Mm -hmm. they were allowing men who had a past of accusation of sexual abuse to uh, have positions like elders or assistance to the elders and hold those positions in congregations all over the world. And the the reason they allowed this is because if there were accusations made against an elder, for instance, that he molested someone and they came forward to other elders to accuse this individual, if the uh, accused one denied that he did this and there was not another witness to the accusation, uh, this is based on a Bible belief from the Old Testament of having to have two two or more witnesses to sin. Correct. Now, Barbara, let me just ask you, let me just, let me interrupt you here for a minute because I want to just clarify a bit. Are you suggesting that the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses deliberately and consciously promoted people who had been accused of child abuse into the high ranks of their organization? And were these people who had been convicted of this? I usually accused, and if they denied it, it went nowhere. The accusation went nowhere. The witness don't go to the authorities because they handle things in-house, as many churches do. Also, the... Uh, but, but, but I guess my, my question to you, Barbara, is that uh, did the did Jehovah's Witness understand that these people had been 
accused before bringing them into the church and before making them elders and giving them positions of prominence? Well, many of them were well, accused this? in the church. And I they were, okay. there comes this one aspect that many religious people understand, and that is repentance. And if these people did confess, they repented. And uh, under a, a religious law, that takes the a forefront. And you can, how are so, you going to say, oh, uh, you know, you really haven't, and you're going to do this again, and you're saying that just so you can get the good graces. I mean, that is not part of Christian religion. Repentance is very important. And if wow. the individual uh, repented, they waited a while, and if his acts were good and he continued to be very godly and involved in the house house ministry, then he would could possibly be made elder again if he was an elder or a assistant. And as time went on, I learned about how it worked. It, and initially, I wasn't too sure. I knew they had these people in positions of authority who were accused of molestation, and uh, they denied it. So because of the, there wasn't another witness to the molestation before the judicial committee of three elders, the accusation went nowhere. And then there came in another issue, and that's confidentiality, because there was an accusation and the victim could not produce another victim. Uh, Then the uh, victim was told to remain silent about this. You cannot accuse someone and uh, go around. So, uh, Barbara, what, what... Let me just ask you, what, what you're saying then is that the victim of a child sexual abuse, that person or assumedly their parents went into the authorities at the watchtower and, and tried to get something done, and they were told basically that um, they couldn't talk about it. I mean, what, what would happen when somebody went in? To, to well, basically it's handled at the Kingdom Hall Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. So each Kingdom Hall has elders and a victim of any sort of sin would take it to the elders that's the scriptural command this is for kind of sinful things like drunkenness in the bible it's it that's the application not crime and that was the really big issue for me people were well, taking sure. i mean criminal accusations so you have situations the, where people went to th- they went to the elders at Kingdom Hall, and what the elders told them was that they wouldn't do anything about it, and that the you people involved in the crime. Wit- uh, yeah. And well, what if, if, what if they had another witness? If they had uh, another witness, then the individual who was accused uh, would be uh, disfellowshipped or excommunicated, as in the Catholic religion. Okay. But, and but still, it wouldn't be reported to the authorities. The witness elders did not encourage going to the authorities. They, they, that was the problem. They didn't discourage it. Years ago, right. they definitely did. But when I became aware of all this in the 90s, they certainly didn't encourage it. And, you know, a Catholic bishop in, out of Mexico said at one point, it, this was in, uh, oh, 2003 or four, when the Catholic situation was really hot and heavy, said we didn't want to air our dirty laundry in public. Well, the witnesses are the right. same, similar attitude. They didn't want to bring reproach, they call it, upon God's yes. organization. And they, they see converts. Certainly, if this had, had this problem was known, Certainly, nobody would want to become one of Joe's witnesses. That's for sure. Right, so, right. I get it. it. So, it sounds very and, similar to the uh, the situation in the Catholic Church in uh, around well, two thousand three, two thousand four. Yeah. That's right. And that and basically, what happened was that there was they, they developed a um, I don't know. I guess a culture of cover up and of uh, you know of uh, sort of this idea that. Um, the the reputation of the church is first and that we can't afford a scandal because that will discourage our mission. So the, the goodness of the mission allegedly became the more paramount interest than 
protecting children, number one, and number two, then covering up crimes. Now, were there any lawsuits brought against the church, like the way it was brought against the Catholic Church? I mean, were there were there any uh, settlements or anything like that that you know of? Oh yes, there were. When I learned about this, I did not know that there were many mega buck lawsuits set by Watchtower secretly for years. I found out I about see. that through the fella who was at the world headquarters, who was actually the editor of the Watchtower's magazine called The Awake. And he told me that they were mega buck lawsuits. And so they hoped that after 1997 that this wouldn't be the case, that they were going to handle these things differently. And they were, they were never going to put in anybody in a position of authority who had background of child abuse. It's that their rules said that if he was known as the molester, well, that was really not true because what they defined as the known molester was somebody who was known in the church or the community as a molester. But if he wasn't known as that and he appeared to do good and he was a faithful witness, then eventually they would allow him in. Well, when all of this came to a head, about the time when the Catholic Church was having their problems and there was that California window year, well, that was the year that many uh, victims of Jehovah's Witnesses came forward in California, and they sued the Watchtower over this. Of course, I was very involved in that. I had left the organization in 1998 over the child abuse problem because they weren't really changing their rules. It just appeared like it, they were. And so I, I just see. washed my hands of that. But eventually I was able to uh, discuss this with lawyers and with um, news media. And we were on the Dateline show in 2002, in uh, May 28th. And so since that time, there have been a number of settlements and in two, 2007, there were 16 victims who settled with Watchtower. All right, Barbara, we're going to take a brief break. We'll be right back. Barbara Anderson's my guest. We're talking about the Watchtower and child abuse. Taking back America one listener at a time. Chuck Morse speaks. Thank you very much. Barbara Anderson is here. Barbara is exposing the ongoing scandal. Apparently, Barbara, this has not reached a level of public awareness that the um, child sex abuse scandal reached uh, for the Catholic Church, which led them to implement some very strong reforms. Uh, is there any uh, indication that the Watchtower is coming to grips with this problem, and are there any moves to reform and make the uh, turn the ship of state right again? I don't see any changes for the better. In fact, in uh, lawsuits that are currently filed, in a <laughs> got themselves in a really big mess because they refuse to produce documents during uh, this one trial. Well, it hadn't come to trial yet. It was pre-trial, and they were, were asked to produce documents going back to 1977, all their child abuse docu documents that they have at the world headquarters. They refused to produce the documents. One of the Jehovah's Witnesses' governing body ordered to appear uh, for a deposition, and he refused to come to the deposition. So that has resulted in an extraordinary occurrence. Uh, the judge also, uh, the appeals court in California, a appeals court in California, and the Supreme Court of California that ordered that this take place because the Watchtower organization, as a defendant in the lawsuit, this lawsuit mm -hmm. was part of uh, eight victims 
who have settled out of court previously, and this one uh, was going to jury in the near future. But since the white chair would not cooperate with the judge, at, nor the appeals court, nor the California Supreme Court to produce the documents or the witness, the judge then she ordered that the watchtower as defendant be separated from the lawsuit and she oh. it's terminating sanctions and so she sanctioned the watchtower over this and she actually it's it's a, um, a def- default judgment against them and ordered them to pay thirteen million five hundred thousand dollars and this is just a oh, week or so ago which they are going to appeal again, and yep. so that that case that situation is is really uh, extraordinary because terminating sanctions is a rare, is a rarity, and for a corporation the size of the Watchtower, uh, with many many other corporations attached to it, it's a multi billion dollar religion, and for it to turn its back on. The court, so the land, in this case, the California Supreme Court also, is remarkable that they are doing this. And we have really no knowledge as to why they're pursuing this course. They have also, in another case, are are refusing to produce documents. So that will also be up to a judge to decide what type of uh, judgment. And so when you have $13.5 million dollars, a judgment against you, you think you'd cooperate. Well, they're not cooperating. They, you know, they settled in 2007 paying $12.5 million out to 16 victims. And now there wow. are 20 lawsuits that we know of filed against them. A few weeks ago, there were four uh, lawsuits in Connecticut filed. Uh, well, Barbara, let me let me ask you this, if I could just uh, get in the board here. Um, it seems to me that if with these sorts of out, you know, these sorts of settlements, I mean, they, if they don't fix this problem, they're going to go broke. I mean, what are they uh, thinking? I mean, I don't know what they're thinking. It'll take a while. You know, they lost a case which did make the news, and that was 2012, and that was a jury trial, and the jury decided on. Total punitive and compensatory, $28 million. And so that's an appeal. And Who is the head of the Watchtower? Is he like a, a, a pope, a version of a pope? No, is he like a, a chief elder? A governing body, and that's made of, right now it's made up of men who uh, rule uh-huh. uh, the uh, organization well, internationally. Somebody has to, you know, somebody has to turn up the heat on them publicly, and I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. Uh, Barbara, we're going to get another break here. We'll be right back. Barbara Anderson's my guest. We're talking about the Watchtower Bible of Tract Society and Child Abuse. We'll be right back. Chuck Morse Speaks. Thank you very much, and uh, Barbara Anderson's my guest. We're talking about the scandal around the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society um, and uh, and their involvement in uh, covering up child abuse, which is uh, something that uh, very well could be going on as we speak. And uh, the the, uh, the scandal has already cost them a great deal, but it seems like they are circling the wagons even further. And uh, I think that ultimately what brought the Catholic Church to finally uh, do the right thing, and, and uh, at least to an extent. I don't know if any of these priests actually were imprisoned. A few of them were, um, or held account, but at least they put in standards to stop the crimes. The thing that did it was public exposure. Barbara, you're working to expose this publicly. You come on this program. You're probably doing other programs. Um, what can we do to really bring this issue up nationally to apply the pressure that needs to be applied, not to hurt the church, but to make the church do the right thing, to actually ask them to go back to their biblical principles, which is to oppose these sorts of crimes. 
Well, the problem with the watchtower is a belief, and and if they would change their mind on the belief of two witnesses to crime, then things would change. But because they feel their belief is the most important thing and that government should not interfere with be a religious belief, and we know secular courts don't get involved with a religious belief, but they will get involved when a religion causes harm or the, its conduct that uh, that the authorities will get involved with. And that's why the uh, throughout the uh, United States and now in Britain there have been cases filed, and in information coming out to the public is the most important thing because people will not join this religion. And if you if you don't have members, you're no longer a religion. And the young people in this organization are leaving it because of their old-fashioned ideas and old beliefs and taking the Bible literally, information well, emanating out. Barbara, of you know, look, I don't, I actually don't have a problem with their believing that you need two witnesses. That is biblical. However, for their own good and to try to do the right thing, even if there's one witness, they ought to take action to, uh, anyways, I mean, there's nothing that precludes that. There's nothing that would stop them from at least firing somebody who's involved in this. And there's certainly nothing that would stop them from making sure that the secular authorities handle right. an investigation without their You're making right. an accusation. I mean, I think they could continue the uh, the two witness idea and uh, you know do the right thing. I mean, there's a way around it without while preserving the biblical principle. Well, what takes the place for Christians in the two witness to crime? is the Romans, the 13th chapter, which specifically says that the authorities, they were put in place by God, and they're called higher powers. It says every soul has to be in subjection to the higher powers, and and the higher powers are the authorities, and they are given the sword, so, so to speak, in that uh, very 13th chapter for the... Uh, to make judgment or pass judgment on the wicked. And so if Jehovah's Witnesses would not have a judicial hearing when an accusation to crime is made, nothing wrong with the two-witness policy, I agree with you. But to have two witnesses in to disfellowship an individual is a different thing than to harbor a criminal that who denies that he he or she molested and then it's not reported to the authorities. Well, for years it wasn't. Now what the witnesses do is if it's a mandate. Uh-huh. Okay, we've got another break here, Barbara. We'll be right back. Uh, Barbara Anderson, we're talking about some strategies for what to do about this crime of child abuse at the Watchtower. Chuck Morse speaks. Thank you very much, Bob Anderson, my guest, independent writing and editing professional and an advocate for child protection. You know, Barbara, this is uh, it is really a, a question of how to scale the watchtower without making the uh, watchtower faith feel threatened. Um, I think that to go about it by saying, well, you know, you have to change your faith, that, that I, I don't think that's the way to do it. I think it's it's to try to get them to go about this for their own interest, to preserve their I faith. I agree with you. Um, and f- yeah, belief. find a way to... Well, there is a way. All they have to do is to, when there is an accusation of child abuse or any criminal offense, there should just simply, every elder should be instructed to, by the watchtower, to tell the, the one making the accusation to go to the authorities. If the authorities investigate, not elders investigating, which is what they do within each congregation where there's an accusation made, and cease and desist the investigation within the witness community, let the accused and accuser, let them both be uh, looked, the cases looked into, let them both press their case are their innocence with the authorities, as the Bible says, that that the higher powers are the ones to make these kind of decisions. So 
that would solve this. And why they're so stubborn about it, I don't know, but they are absolutely in a, in a transcript of a, the trial in 2012 in California. It was the Conte, Candace Conte trial. They mentioned belief, and they're going to hold to it's their belief. Well, we don't want them to get rid of their belief. And when the authorities say that the accused is guilty and he's penalized, uh, then the congregation can make a decision, uh, the congregation elders can make a decision whether to disfellowship or not. That's that's okay. That's, that's scriptural. No, we don't care about that. But the children are, are getting hurt when you uh, do not believe an accused uh, that an individual uh, the accusation you don't believe the accusation made by the the victim then it puts that uh, situation into a far worse situation exactly okay we'll be right back let's go great there sorry about that barbara we'll be right back you'll want to listen when chuck moore speaks on the Information Radio Network. Thank you very much. Barbara Anderson's my guest. Uh, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. We're talking about their scandal regarding child abuse and the fact that um, they are not addressing this problem. It is possibly of the same magnitude as that confronted by the Catholic Church about 10, 10 12 years ago now. Uh, Barbara, uh, how can I help? Where do we go from here? What can we do to uh, to get something done here? Well, it's uh, publicizing it. That's the most important thing. You know, I want to I want to especially mention this. These cases of child molestation. I know I haven't answered your question yet, but I will. But these cases are horribly egregious. In the uh, beginning of this year, a uh, witness went to prison for molesting seven boys in the beginning of this year. And that was in Fort Myers, Florida, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Oh, that's so sickening. Ella got life imprisonment. So did the one in Fort Myers yeah. got life imprisonment. Uh, Dallas, just last week, filed a case. Six children, five girls, one boy. They're young adults. Statute of limitations does not apply in this case, we have one out of Oklahoma, seven children involved. The statute of limitations was the problem. The, the perpetrator is walking the streets, and uh, the elders hid for years. He was the presiding overseer of the congregation, which is the one who's kind of in charge of all the other elders. In each congregation, there is one. They wouldn't believe the children. What happens is if you don't believe an accusation and the fella or the woman who's a molester are a pedophile, they go on to molest more children. And that's why you're seeing so many cases. When I first found out about this back in 91, there was a case in just where he got 40 children over years. This is a patriarchal oh organization. What's wrong with men? I am mean, you know, I have no problem there. I was part of this organization for decades. I really respected the men. But the point is, the beliefs and the way that the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses is laid out, it's a system that actually attracts pedophiles. So oh my. Uh, I'm talking about thousands and thousands of cases of, of uh, molestation over a period probably of 50 years that they they knew about it at the headquarters because when there is an accusation made at a congregation, the elders have to report it to New York, to the headquarters. Wow. And they have all the records which they refuse to allow to be given to the lawyers in these cases. And they have all sorts yeah. of excuses. Well, let, we're going to let the authorities take care of that. But what we need is a change in the SOL, statute of limitations from state to state. They're arbitrary, and they need to all be the same. No more statute of limitations. It won't overload the judiciary system, which is what opposers, such as the Catholic Church, who spent $2 million lobbying against statute of limitations. Now, why would yeah. they do that? Why don't they all cooperate? Don't they care about children? What the heck? Put the past behind you I and know, really. change. 
so that the kids in the future won't be harmed. I have grandchildren. I did this to protect my grandchildren because I knew they were molesters in practically every congregation that I uh, that I have ever associated with. I found it out when I was up at the world headquarters. Wouldn't you or any of your listeners go forward when you found out this? No matter how much you believe in your religion, which is subjective anyway, but I mean, after right. all, so you're in love with your religious beliefs. You're in love with God. If you love God, then you're going to love his children, and you're going to love his, which are people and their kids. And and they have put these children. You in know, one of the ironies, one of the ironies. I'm looking at the website for the Jehovah's Witness. They're very involved in questions of child rearing and how you yes. know marriage and couples. And and I mean, it, it makes it even more ironic that they would have this kind of corruption going on. Yes, they're not a transparent organization. That is for sure. And they do have rules and regulations on every aspect of the members' lives. And people trust them implicitly. Until the story broke in 2002 on the Dateline program when thousands and thousands of witnesses left the organization over child abuse, when that story broke from then on, it's constant. Our fight against them is constant behind the scenes. I talked on the phone with victims all the time. They're calling me. I have a website, watchtowerdocuments.org, which has all the documents from co- the court record. All right, Barbara, we'll be right back. to sit tight. Thank you. Author, journalist, and American patriot. This is Chuck Morse Speaks. Well, Barbara, you know, you've done a great job of exposing this issue. You're obviously very passionate about it, and for darn good reason. You have children being abused and a huge cover up by this massive organization that is worldwide, by the way. I'm looking at their website. They're in they're in Liechtenstein and Sierra Leone. I mean, they're everywhere. everywhere. And uh, this is a big and this is a big job to try to expose this corruption and to try to get something done to protect children which is really what this is about you know That's i mean right. I, I think the better way the good the good way to go about it is to not threaten their religion just say right. turn in people into don't. authorities exactly and let's just get children protected so that you can actually be more in line with what you claim to value so uh, we only have a few minutes left here barbara let people know how they can reach you how they can get involved in what you're doing Okay. My, as I said, my my website is watchtowerdocuments.org, and uh, I can be contacted through that website. What we are doing, we're really driving hard on the statute of limitations issue. We want to get rid of that. If we contact the legislature of your different state, that's always hung up for one reason or another. Uh, some states have lengthened uh, the statute of limitations, like I think Pennsylvania is 50 years, up to 50 years, you can go forward with a law. But it's different in every state. Uh, Get them all to get rid of statute of limitations like Delaware, Maine, and by the way, Guam. They're not having an overload of their judiciary systems from getting rid of statute of limitations. Uh, so no, every state should get rid of them. Then, uh, then also, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, there's over, I think, a million four hundred thousand in the United States. They should petition their own governing body to uh, put aside this two-witness policy as far as crime goes and don't investigate in within the religion. Tell everyone who knows of a child abuse in the organization to go to the authorities. All right, Barbara Anderson, thanks so much for joining me this afternoon. <laughs> 